I'm standing in a little bit of bush on Red Hill overlooking Canberra, and beyond the lake there, you can see the twin peaks of Black Mountain, and further to the right, Mount Ainsley. And the landscape itself goes thrrr, thrrr, like that. And in the Aboriginal language, this area is known as Ngambri, which means a woman's cleavage. So the name of Australia's capital is derived from a big pair of tits. Is that respectful? I'll leave it to you to judge. It's time to wave my finger around and see what Canberra has in store. From the heights of Red Hill to Mitchell in the north. I'll find out which PM sold his soul to the advertising devil. Ho, 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 ho. Play art critic to a bunch of aspiring young painters. Incredibly high standard. And show you the secret side of one of Canberra's most famous attractions. It's great being on telly, isn't it? Canberra is, of course, the capital of Australia. And it's the political hub, too, because this is where all the federal buildings are. And it was designed specifically for that purpose. But how do you create a capital from scratch? Hi, Dave. Hey, Tony. Excuse me, ladies. Do you mind if I uh, kidnap him for a minute? <laughs> Dave, January the 1st, 1901. All the states have decided that they're going to band together and create this new country, Australia. But they're going to have to have a capital, aren't they? How did they decide where that capital would be? Well, as early as the early 1890s, they talked about all sorts of places right across the country. But as soon as you got close to 1901, and in fact the Constitution, there was a section, Tony, section 125, which said it had to be New South Wales. That was political, take my word for it. Yeah. Had to be New South Wales but at least 100 miles from Sydney. They were not looking north. They were not looking to the likes of Port Macquarie or the beautiful Byron Bay, beach, beach towns north of Sydney. They were looking south into the colder areas. Yeah, why the colder climates? There was a feeling that was just about universal amongst the white population of Australia that Anglo-Saxons, Anglo-Celts only um, thought best, were able to be intellectually stimulated the most by growing up in a cold climate. So they had a site, now they needed a name. Buncombe, Wheatwool Gold and Sid Melad per Briz Ho were just some of the rejects, thank goodness. And Canberra, the name the locals had used for 80 years, was chosen. Hooray! Everyone was happy. Well, not everyone. Seems odd to me, but even now, there are non canberrans who still sneer at their little bush capital. So uh, what's the reaction of local people towards that? Well, I think that uh, the local population, there is, you know, th there is no chip on the shoulder anymore. You reckon there is no chip on the shoulder anymore? I absolutely Do you think he's don't. right? There is no chip on the shoulder <laughs> from Canberrans anymore. Look, let's test this out, shall we? Let's see. This is an empirical demonstration do about it. whether go. or not they have. Ladies and gentlemen, do you mind when people call you horrible names? No. All right, well, let's see whether this really hurts your souls, OK? If a man were to stay very long at Canberra, he would probably be afflicted with something worse than anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you can take that, can you? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's very close. It's a cemetery without lights. <laughs> we have lights. <laughs> oh, you go up <laughs> And that one's just not accurate, OK. <laughs> Six suburbs in search of a soul. We have solar panels. Yeah, you either have solar panels. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's a retort to that one, isn't it? <laughs> OK, I accept that there wasn't the reaction that I might have expected, <laughs> although I do think that six suburbs in search of a soul got some kind of uh, uh, feeling about it. Well, Tony, for me, only because you're talking six. We're now 100 suburbs and there is plenty of soul. All right, I believe you. Cheers, <laughs> mate. Cheers, Tony. Thank you for your patience on such a cold afternoon. All right, it's hardly in-depth analysis, but I reckon Canberrans are proud of their little patch. Good on them. As for the rest of you Aussies, get off their case, all right? I'm supposed to be going straight into town, but I thought I would take a little detour down Canberra Avenue, because I want to show you this. See that 
white lady funerals, a woman's understanding. That's very reassuring, isn't it? And there, nice little bus stop, beautiful dual carriageway with lovely mature trees on it. The whole thing is so nice, so suburban, except, see those two windows? For the last 50 years, on and off, members of Australia's Secret Service have been spying on the Russians in their embassy over there. And when I knocked on that door this morning, there was no reply, which either means there's nobody there or else they're watching us now. Still, let them watch, I say. This rabid remember the 70s lefty's got nothing to hide. And what's more, he's not afraid to name names. Australians have got this really good knack of finding funny nicknames for their prime ministers. I mean, we've got the Iron Lady back in the UK, but we haven't got Kevin 24-7 or Little Johnny Howard or Pig Eye and Bob Menzies. And there's one other one, excuse me, one second, which I think is absolutely great. Do any of you know which of your prime ministers was nicknamed Toby Tosspot? No? No? I do. Go on, go on. It was Sir Edmund Barton. Edmund Barton, absolutely right. Your very first Prime Minister. Have you got a moment to, uh, to come over and have a look at him? Edmund Barton, a great champion of federalism. Everybody thought he is the perfect man to be the Prime Minister of the new federation, even though he was known to drink gallons of booze, which is why he was known as Toby Tosspot, uh, and it was also, by his own admission, very lazy, particularly after lunch. Still, he was a pretty effective PM and a worthy addition to the High Court, which he just happened to set up before he chucked in the country's top job in 1903. Nice work if you can get it. But what I find extraordinary about him... Take a look at this. While he was on the High Court, he was in an advertisement for soap. And he says, the highest authorities agree, velvet soap washes linen snow white. It's a racist joke. When he was prime minister, he got through the white Australia policy, which made it so difficult for people of different ethnicities to come and work and live here. So they're saying, He's the guy who can tell whether or not soap is any good in making things white because he's made the country white. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry to stop you, but I just thought that was so interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Velvet soap is very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you. Just up the road at the National Archives, there's another prime ministerial tribute. A poignant reminder of the 17th PM, Harold Holt. When he drowned in rough seas off Victoria in 1967, a nation already polarised by the unpopular Vietnam War and social unrest was stunned. Well, this isn't a prime minister on a plinth, is it? These are the ordinary, everyday items that Prime Minister Holt had with him on the day that he died. There's his bag. And in it, there were a few share prices scribbled down, a political pamphlet, handful of money, half of it decimal, half of it not. That's good dating evidence, isn't it? Four packs of matches. When a national leader dies in tragic circumstances, there's a temptation, isn't there, to view the circumstances around the death as though we were watching a widescreen film or looking at a Renaissance painting, as though it was something epic and grand. But what's so lovely about these few bits and bobs is that they remind us that Harold Holt may have been a prime minister, but he was just an ordinary man who happened to have lived an extraordinary life. I'm walking through a lovely patch of Canberra known as the Parliamentary Triangle. But it's also home to some of Australia's biggest cultural institutions. 
In there, there's a painting that's absolutely huge and it completely dominates the gallery that it's in. It's so colourful, energetic, vibrant, swirls all over the place. It's called Blue Poles and it was painted by the abstract expressionist painter, American guy called Jackson Pollock. I could take you inside to see it, but an unexpected encounter has given me an even better idea. My friends from the Ainsley Primary School. Hi, guys. Hi. They have said that they're prepared to paint a version of Blue Poles. You've all seen Blue Poles, haven't you? Yes. And so I want you either to paint it just like you actually saw it or how it inspires you, how it makes you feel, OK? And the best one will show on the telly, right? You ready to go? Yes. One, two, three, get painting! Oh. Right, that's got them started. Now, let me tell you, when this painting was first bought by Australia in the early 1970s, there was a huge fuss about it because it cost $1.3 million. And at the time, the guy who used to buy paintings for this place was only allowed to spend $1 million on each painting. Any more, he had to ask the permission of the Prime Minister, who happened to be Gough Whitlam. So he bought it, and immediately there was a huge furor from among those people who hated Gough Whitlam, and also from those people who didn't like modern art. Now, it is possible to criticise the Whitlam government, but in this case, he got it absolutely dead cold right. This has become one of the most famous pieces of modern art in the world. Not only that, on the open market, they reckon you could get up to $100 million for it now. So there. Right, let's see how they've got on. Stop painting now. I like those poles, they're good. Could, could you just hold your painting up in front of you? It's an incredibly high standard. Um, yours is the one that looks most like the painting over there. Very good. But, what's your name? Will. Will, yours is the one that's got most energy. That's the one that feels most to me like Blue Poles does. So, Will, I declare you the winner. Give him a big hand, everybody. <laughs> And, Will, there is a fabulous prize for you. There you are. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Thanks a lot, all of you. Cheers, guys. Thanks for your work. Bye. Bye. I'm halfway through my walk around the national capital. So far, I've called it names, run into a few PMs, and nurtured Australia's next big abstract impressionist. Time to go back to its spiritual beginnings. May 1927, the grand opening of the Parliament building. There's Dame Nellie Melba singing God Save the King, Stanley Melbourne Bruce, the Australian Prime Minister, the future King of England, George VI, and next to him, his wife, Elizabeth. Lots of people with feathers sticking out of their hats. And can you see around there some bloke looking out of the window? All very exciting. And although Canberra was only a small town, a few locals turned up to ooh at the royals and ah at the speeches and ooh and ah at the spectacular celebrations. Well, I say spectacular. Well, the flypass was really badly timed. When Dame Nellie Melba sang, it went, God save our... Meow. Long live our... Meow. And the future king speech was virtually obliterated too. But the very worst thing was that one of the pilots of the planes crashed and died. And you can imagine how shaken up by that everybody was. But I'm not done with Old Parliament House yet. 50 years later, it was home to more drama, the greatest political crisis in Australia's short history. The 1975 dismissal was a constitutional menage a trois, pitting PM and Labour hero Gough Whitlam against the ambitious but weak-willed Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, and the autocratic Liberal opposition leader, Malcolm Fraser. 
It was a political intrigue par excellence, and I still can't get enough of it. Jenny, this is a story that's always absolutely fascinated me. And what happened on that day itself? If you look at the, uh, at the coverage, the newspaper coverage of the early morning of November 11th, 1975, there was a sort of a lull around Canberra. There was an expectation that the political crisis which had been in existence for the previous month with supply bills blocked in the Senate had actually lifted because Whitlam had decided he would call a half-Senate election. That was the political decision that would actually resolve the crisis situation. He was going to the country. That's right, he was going to call an election. But Kerr jumped the gun and sacked his government. Whitlam, though, had an ace up his sleeve. He went to the House of Reps and moved a successful motion of no confidence in the now caretaker Prime Minister, Fraser. And that, of course, gave us one of the most memorable and imitated speeches in Australian politics. All together now, well may we say God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor-General. I mean, the outcry if the Queen would ever presume to remove an elected government in, in Britain can only be imagined. And yet in Australia, it was a sort of reassertion of that divine right of kings to, to remove an elected government and to replace that government with a party that had actually lost the previous two elections. So yes, I think there's no doubt now that it should never have happened, but it did happen. And so it sits there now as an unfortunate precedent that could technically occur again. Well, let's hope it never, ever does. I'm with you on that. Tony. Ever Thank so you. much. Bye. Bye bye. I'm just heading across Kings Bridge now towards another big thing. That's the Australian American Memorial, recognising the Yanks' contribution to Australia's defence in World War II. And who opened it? Britain's Queen of England, of course. Go figure. People around here rather affectionately call this thing the Bugs Bunny. It's not that easy to see why, but if you just squint a bit... There. See what I mean? What strikes me about my walk so far is that Canberra seems to be saying, look at me, I'm important. I've got big buildings and big lakes and big monuments. That building, which always reminds me of a big cigarette lighter, is actually called the Carillion. Carillion's just a posh word for bell tower, really. And it was given to Australia by the British. See how generous we are? And it's not just a bell tower. You can actually play it. There's a keyboard at the bottom, and people can give concerts. And the musicians who play it are known as Carillionists. Bet you didn't know that. Actually, Canberra's come a long way in a short time. It's fair to say that barely 60 years ago, it wasn't much more than a rural town surrounding a big white building full of pollies. But that's all changed, thanks to a mum, a baby and a pram. Hey, I love, I love your hat. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And what's this one's name? This is Miriam. How old is she? She's almost four weeks. Do you know the name of this walkway that you're walking them on? No, is it the it, walk around the lake? Yeah, well, yeah, that's one. Any idea? No. Uh, come on, I'll tell you all about it. You know that back in the 1940s, they decided that for the course of the war, Canberra would be too isolated. So yeah. a lot of government departments went down to Melbourne. The Prime Minister at the time was Robert Menzies. He loathed Canberra, at least he did, until his daughter came to live here, uh, yeah. and she'd got a little baby and she used to push the baby along just like you're doing now, except there wasn't any kind of walkway here. There wasn't really much here at all. It was just like a, you know, a country town with a few government buildings in. It was driving her mad. And the family got on his case about how appalling Canberra was, and eventually he said, all right, all right, all right, I loathe Canberra, but I realise that it is our capital and we've got to do something about it. And it was him who got this lake put in. And he made sure that there were plenty of places for people to live, got rid of a lot of red tape. And eventually, in memory of him, this walkway was put in because he was the person who transformed people's attitudes towards this wonderful capital that we now have. Thank goodness he did. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you'd be going, <laughs> goom, 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 with the brands. 
Anyway, nice to talk to you. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye, bye sweetheart. Bye. It may sound strange, but I've actually had enough of open spaces. I'm craving people and bustle and energy, and maybe even some refreshment. This pub, as you can see, is called King O'Malley's. O'Malley was an Australian MP. Uh, he was also a bit of a rogue, and he was one of those extraordinary visionaries who believed that one day Canberra could be a capital of international renown. And he was also teetotal and made sure that Canberra remained dry, which is why there are still so few pubs in the town today. Um, although one of them is called O'Malley's, which is a bit ironic, isn't it? It might be the cold, or it might just be Canberra, but the city centre seems a little quiet today. So I'm heading off to one of Canberra's oldest suburbs, Ainsley. I know I'm supposed to be going on a walk through Canberra, but I want to take you down to Sydney for a moment and back about uh, 150 years. In the 1860s, funeral parties arriving at Rookwood Cemetery turned up at this place. It was a railway station designed to look like a church, practical and sensitive at the same time. OK, so now flash forward 100 years to Canberra, right here to the suburb of Ainsley, and not only is there a housing crisis, there is a church-building crisis. There just aren't the materials to build the churches. Hi! just talking about your church. They got this lovely parish hall, but no church. So, the people here heard that there was this dilapidated mortuary station down in Sydney, and they paid a hundred pounds for it, went down to Sydney and transported it back here, brick by brick, and look, here it is. And look, that's where the trains used to go in and out, but now they had their lovely new parish church. See what they did? And in fact, the only significant change they made was that they moved the bell tower from that side over to that side so that the parishioners would be able to hear the bell ringing on service days. And this was a brilliant thing to do because back in the 50s, early 60s, virtually every new building in Canberra uh, was modern and sharp-edged and uh, a bit brutal, but the people here haven't got that. They've got this gorgeous Gothic Revival church and a great story to tell. Hello, here's the vicar. Good to see you, Tony. Hey, good to see you too. Yeah. This is such a beautiful building. We're blessed, aren't we? You yeah. are blessed. Yeah. See you guys. Welcome. It's nice to meet you. Bye. I've saved the most unusual for last. You can't miss the Australian War Memorial in Campbell, but you might walk straight past the one in the outer industrial suburb of Mitchell. See? Australian War Memorial. It's not this one here, it's a different one. This is where they store all the stuff that doesn't fit in the fancy War Memorial down the road. Look at this. Isn't that fantastic? It's like a giant toy box. It's the Trelaw Annex, after John Trelaw, the War Memorial's second director. Come on, have a look at this. Come on. Look, this is real fun. This is called a well bike. It was used in the Second World War by the, by the British Special Operations Executive. <laughs> Guys would be parachuted in with these things. This is collapsible. Imagine the commandos zooming all over the enemy territory with one of those. And that is the wing of a de Havilland caribou. But this is what I really wanted to show you. It's First World War, right? Have a look there. See those bullet holes? And more bullet holes here. It's German, and it was just found lying in no man's land. A lot of people reckon that this is the best collection of World War I material in the entire world. It's only open to the public one day every year, so most people don't know it's here. They let me in. It's great being on telly, isn't it? You know, there's so much stuff in here, I reckon they'd need a second war memorial to fit it all in. 
And what's better than one giant warehouse full of war stuff? Two giant warehouses full of war stuff. These things really do terrify me. It's a V2, and thousands of them were dropped on London during the Blitz. My mum and dad come from the East End, and the stories they told me... I've been petrified of these ever since I was about three. It's great, of course, that all this stuff has been saved, but as the technology of war becomes increasingly complicated, so more and more warehouses like this are getting filled up with war machines. Soon there's not going to be space to curate them all. Be nice if there were less and less rather than more and more, wouldn't it? Well, Canberra may not be one of Australia's biggest cities, but I reckon that walk alone would take you all day. Canberra was built as a dream, a utopia, somewhere that one day would rival London and Paris and ancient Athens. And has it succeeded? Well, I know I've only done one little walk, but I don't really think so. Not yet, anyway. Yes, there are wide open spaces, and in the last 60 years, they've added grand buildings. But I wanted to grow all the colourful bits and bobs in between. They're the fabric that gives a city its heart and identity. And all right, I know I'm being a bit critical, but then Canberrans can take criticism, can't they? They told me. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.